Welcome to today's Authors at Google event. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. David Michaels, who is here to discuss his book, Doubt is Their Product, How Industry's Assault on Science Threatens Your Health, which examines the use and misuse of science in shaping public policy. Dr. Michaels is an epidemiologist and former government regulator. During the Clinton administration, he served as Assistant Secretary of Energy for Environment, Safety, and Health. He is currently a research professor and associate chairman at the George Washington University School of Public Health and Health Services, where he directs the project on scientific knowledge and public policy. In 2006, Dr. Michaels received the American Association for the Advancement of Science's Scientific Freedom and Responsibility Award for his work on behalf of nuclear weapons workers and for advocacy for scientific integrity. Following the talk, we'll have a Q&A session and book signing. Remember, if you ask a question for our YouTube audience, to use the microphone in the center. And now it's my honor to introduce Dr. Michaels. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thank you all for coming out. My book is about how mercenary scientists manipulate studies for polluters and manufacturers of dangerous products. I show there's a whole new industry that manufactures scientific doubt enabling these polluters to continue to endanger public health. I call this the Enronization of science. These studies are like the accounting work that some Arthur Anderson company accountants did for Enron before both companies went bankrupt. They appear to play by the rules of the discipline, but their objective is to help corporations frustrate public health and environmental regulators and prevail in court. Everyone knows how the tobacco manufacturers used science to discredit the studies that showed cigarettes were killing thousands of people. Now there's a whole industry of scientists for hire who cast doubt on studies. These scientists help manufacturers pretend that dangerous activities or products, from global warming to Vioxx, are not really dangerous. I open the book with a story about aspirin and Rise syndrome. It used to be that Rise syndrome was a a fairly rare but present disease. Each year, about 500 cases were reported, and that was probably an undercount. A third of them were fatal. Every parent today knows you never give a kid aspirin, but most of us have forgotten why. By the early 1980s, there were several studies linking Rye syndrome to children taking aspirin, mostly because they had viral syndromes. The CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, issued an alert to the medical community but when the Food and Drug Administration tried to require aspirin makers to warn parents against giving children aspirin, the industry started a public campaign questioning the evidence. The White House got involved, and this was the Reagan administration, and they backed the aspirin makers. Only lawsuits and congressional oversight forced the White House to back off, and the FDA was eventually allowed to require warnings on aspirin. Now this, on one level, is a public health success story, but it's, it is a bittersweet one. Instead of 500 cases a year, we now see about five cases a year. Thousands of lives have been saved, but because of the needless delay, hundreds were undoubtedly lost. That was early. That was the 1980s. But the, and the approach wasn't as widespread then as it is now. In fact, now it's ubiquitous. The story, though, has to start with tobacco. In 1950, five studies were published linking cigarette smoking to lung cancer. John Hill, the founder of Hill & Knowlton, now a public relations giant, understood that the tobacco industry desperately needed help. He had just finished a, product, a project helping the chemical industry fend off a congressional investigation into chemicals contaminating our food. He understood that big tobacco needed to challenge the science with its own mercenary research. Hill & Knowlton designed an extraordinarily successful campaign best described by a tobacco executive who unwisely wrote in a memo, doubt is our product, since it is the best means of competing with the body of fact that exists in the minds of the general public. It is also the means of establishing controversy. And the tobacco industry spent millions of dollars and many years manufacturing doubt. Hill and Knowlton ran a remarkable campaign. It even had its own journal, Smoking and Health Research, uh, which contained articles about Anything about tobacco that not causing lung cancer or anything about other, something else causing lung cancer. I brought one page along for those of you who took the handouts. Um, these are two front pages from different issues of tobacco and health research from 1964 and 1965. And you can see the articles um, 
for those of you who are in other sites or watching on YouTube, all of these documents are on the web at defendingscience.org. So this one, here's my favorite. This is um, Lung Cancer Rare in Bald Men. And that was the sort of article they would put out. Of course, it's reassuring to me, but I don't smoke anyway. But, um, uh, but Helen Knowlton's success with tobacco was, was monumental. And it led to widespread use of the same strategy. In fact, Helen Knowlton boasted about it. Now, my book, Doubt Is Their Product, is constructed on documents, many of them previously secret. I brought a few of them here today, and you can take them over the, uh, from the table over here. Um, but all the documents are on the website of the Scientific Knowledge and Public Policy Project at George Washington University, where I work, or defendingscience.org. Um, now, one of the other smoking guns um, that I put into the book is the, the sales pitch, the, the packet of material that Hill and Knowlton then sent out to other industries talking about their success. They didn't even mention tobacco. They talked about the other work that they did. So the one I thought brought along, which I think is most interesting, is the one on Freon, um, chlorofluorocarbons, that we know has, have caused a hole in the ozone layer. I'm going to read you just the beginning of this. You can look at the whole document. Here's how, th how they describe what they did. Scientific allegations that fluorocarbons released from aerosol spray cans were a threat to the Earth's ozone layer and had become a cause celebre in the me media and government. Despite the fact there was no real scientific proof of these charges, and that it would be years before facts could be assembled, the media fastened on the threat of increased skin cancer and the doomsday aspect of the story. Public concern and fear about the future caused fluorocarbon users to look to alternatives. Hill and Knowlton was asked by DuPont to help calm fears, get better reporting of the issues, and gain up to two to three years before the government took action to ban fluorocarbons. And that's the point gain a few more years to sell a product. From Freon to Vioxx to global warming, a few more years of sales can mean millions in profits. In Doubt is Their Product, I talk about how Hill and Knowlton spun its magic for tobacco, asbestos, vinyl chloride, and a host of other toxic industries, but also how manufacturing scientific doubt for polluters and producers of dangerous products has become far more sophisticated. Why did this happen? Why did it become more sophisticated? I believe the change can be attributed to the fight over secondhand tobacco smoke. For many years, the tobacco industry could say, with a wink, we don't believe, the evidence that, we don't believe any of the evidence that smoking causes lung cancer. But even if it does, smokers are making the choice for themselves. It's a free country. Smokers are free to put themselves at risk. But with the studies that began to appear in the 1980s showing that secondhand tobacco smoke was increasing the cancer risk among non-smoking spouses, and non-smoking flight attendants, restaurant workers, and others exposed to workplace smoke, it was really a whole new ballgame. Tobacco poured millions into the fight against science, showing low but real risk from secondhand smoke. That campaign continues to have, a long, powerful, have long and powerful repercussions. Tobacco's consultants virtually invented the term junk science to attack the secondhand smoke studies and the EPA's risk assessments based on those studies, all of which, needless to say, have turned out to be very well done and accurate studies. Tobacco's lobbyists came up with several legislative fixes that increase the ability of corporations to derail government reports and regulation, and then found other industries to front for them, recognizing that revealing tobacco's involvement would be the kiss, would be the kiss of death for this legislation. These bills have now been used by the Bush administration to handcuff the EPA now, and it's their hope, into the future. It's an ugly story that I go into some detail in the book. But the other change resulting from the secondhand smoke campaign was on science itself. I believe that some of the ethically challenged scientists saw big money can be made in defending dangerous products. Eventually, the scientists eclipsed the, eclipsed the PR experts, and they set up their own firms. They left Hill and Knowlton in the dust. And these firms have proven to be very successful. The scientists were right, of course, and product defense has become a very lucrative business. These mercenary scientists will produce studies with whatever, concluding whatever their sponsor needs. And the list of topics they've taken on is very impressive. The soft drink industry was battling to maintain the right to sell soda and sweetened beverages in schools. So the tobacco scientists produced a model showing that soda from school vending machines doesn't contribute to the rise in childhood obesity. How many people here think that driving while holding and, and talking on a cell phone increases your risk of an auto accident? Does anyone think it doesn't? Well, the um, you know it's true, it's backed up by plenty of studies, but the cell phone industry, of course, hired some of these same scientists, and they produced reports questioning all the studies. 
And that really delayed a lot of the regulation for a number of years. And the list goes on and on. Uh, in doubt is their product. I've, uncover I've uncovered numerous examples of manufactured uncertainty. Of course, there are new, new ones in the headlines every day. I'm reminded of something Lily Tomlin said. No matter how cynical you become, it's never enough to keep up. Of course, you can see the strategy um, over the causes and effects of global warming. In early 2003, Republican Frank Luntz, who's an advisor, we see him on Fox News all the time now as a sort of an um, expert on words and spin, um, advised his clients in a memo called Winning the Global Warming Debate that it could be accomplished by focusing on uncertainty and the differences among scientists. And another one of the memos I have in here, um, Winning the Global Warming Debate, he wrote, Voters believe there is no consensus about global warming within the scientific community. Should the public come to believe that the scientific issues are settled, their views about global warming will change accordingly. Therefore, and this is in italics, it's bold, he bolds it, you need to continue to make the lack of scientific certainty a primary issue in the debate. Now, of course, it's no longer credible for any scientist to say that global warming doesn't exist. You essentially get laughed out of the room if you say that. But the campaign worked. They gained carbon producers several years. Now they've shifted the debate to, uh, to new topics, essentially on the impact of global warming. They question whether the sea level will actually rise or whether the mosquito population will actually surge, et cetera, et cetera. It's all based on models, and you can debate models forever. I call it global warming denying 2.0. Product defense scientists understand how the regulatory system functions and how to slow it down. I write about the Weinberg Group, which is now the subject of an investigation by the House Energy and Commerce Committee, which they're calling Science for Sale. The Weinberg Group played an active role in tobacco wars on the side of the cigarette manufacturers, of course. They've also worked for many chemical and drug companies, and I still, until I started writing about them, they also publicly boasted about their successes. Now, I have here a case study, um, which was on their website, which they entitled Support to a Drug Manufacturer. And, uh, fortunately, I took a screenshot before I wrote about this in, in Scientific American, after which they took it down. Now, as you read this, or as you listen to this, keep in mind that the Food and Drug Administration requires a drug to get off the market, essentially pulls a drug for one of two reasons. The first reason is the drug simply doesn't work. Not that it doesn't work a little, it doesn't work. The second reason the FDA forces a drug off the market is if the, the risks outweigh the benefits. It usually has to be pretty powerful. The risks have to be quite important and much greater than the benefits for the FDA to say, get this drug off the market. So here's the case study from the Weinberg Group's website describing their work. The Food and Drug Administration proposed cancellation of a registered new drug. Cancellation requires an administrative hearing. The Weinberg Group was retained by two manufacturers of the drug under attack to define strategy for the administrative hearing, identify the experts to be used in the continued support of the drug, and they go on to all the various things they did. This led to an extensive process with a written appeal from the first decision for the commissioner and leading to 10 additional years of sales prior to the ultimate cancellation of the drug. Now, some of the scientific material I cover is pretty technical, but I've written it in a way I think will be understood by non-scientists. I particularly focus on stories which I was involved personally, and so I could write from personal experience. At the Department of Energy, I was in charge of, pr of protecting workers, the communities, and the environment around the nation's nuclear weapons facilities, some of the most dangerous sites in the United States. In making nuclear weapons, we use a metal called beryllium. It's an amazing metal. It's lighter than aluminum and stiffer than steel, but also causes terrible lung disease among some people at unthinkably low exposure levels. When I arrived at the Energy Department, the worker protection rule in effect was one we call the taxicab standard. Why the taxicab standard? Because two scientists on their way, uh, who were on their way to a meeting in 1948 came up with a number essentially on the back of an envelope while they were sitting in the backseat of a taxicab. That standard was a step forward in 1948 when, when it was implemented. But by the time I got to the Energy Department in 1998, 50 years later, we had workers who were exposed at levels below the standard getting chronic beryllium disease. What I discovered was a campaign that the beryllium industry had been engaged in for 30 years at that point to stop the Energy Department and to stop the Occupational Safety and Health Administration from issuing a more protective standard. I uncovered many amazing documents that are on our website and in the book. Most importantly, I was able to help push through a beryllium standard 10 times stronger than, than OSHA, at least for workers in the nuclear weapons complex. At that time, and this was during the Clinton administration, I worked very closely with OSHA 
which itself planned to issue a new standard as well to protect private sector workers exposed to beryllium. Needless to say, those plans were delayed by the election of George W. Bush, and OSHA is still using the now 60-year-old taxicab standard. I write extensively about the Bush administration and how they have institutionalized uncertainty, essentially recognizing how science can be endlessly debated and setting up mechanisms, some of them in secret, that ensure that regulatory agencies will be tied into knots by the endless challenges to the science they use to protect the public. The tragedy known as popcorn workers' lung is a powerful illustration of how the Bush administration has abdicated the government's responsibility to protect the public. In the year 2000, there was an outbreak of a terrible disease called bronchiolitis obliterans, and you can imagine what it is, it, the obliteration of the bronchioles, at a microwave popcorn plant in Missouri. Eight workers developed the disease. Several eventually needed lung transplants. The Missouri Health Department was called in, and they asked for help. They, they called in two federal agencies, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, which is a branch of the Centers for Disease Control, it's not a regulatory agency, but a research agency, was called in, and OSHA was called in. Now, NIOSH came in essentially to help identify what the problem was, and they did great research. They identified the responsible chemical. We now know it's called diacetyl, is the chemical we understand causes popcorn workers' lung. Um, and they made recommendations on how workers could be protected. It took a couple of years, but they did really a, a great job. They also identified more sick workers at other microwave popcorn factories and at the, the flavor factories where the chemical is made. It's also been seen in potato chip factories, candy factories. Any place this chemical is used, workers are at risk. What did OSHA do? The OSHA inspector went to that same Missouri factory, looked around, was there a very short period of time, and said no standards had been violated and therefore went home. As it became clear that more and more workers were sick in factories all over the country, OSHA did only one thing. It established an alliance, as it calls it, with the Popcorn Board, which is a trade association, promising to send out, to develop and send out information, which as far as I can tell never occurred. After a huge amount of political pressure, OSHA is finally moving. They've said they now will issue a standard to protect workers from this chemical, but they've said now it will take several years to finish. It will be at least 10 years after those first cases were identified that OSHA will finally get to that standard. In the meantime, after a single case of bronchiolitis obliterans in a consumer of, of microwave popcorn, the leading microwave popcorn manufacturers have removed diacetyl from their products. So in fact, a standard around diacetyl may in fact not even be needed by the time OSHA gets around to issuing it. While I applaud the move of the pop popcorn work makers, and I've actually worked very closely with one of them, um, we know very little about the replacement chemicals. Could they be dangerous too? We simply don't know, and there is no requirement that they be tested before they're used. Microwave popcorn-related bronchiolitis obliterans is an interesting case because it shows all the holes in the regulatory system. Not only did OSHA not do anything, but the Food and Drug Administration did nothing as well. We, when the first cases came out and we began to realize that this clearly was related to diacetyl, I petitioned the Food and Drug Administration to remove the chemical from its list of generally recognized as safe chemicals. Essentially, the, the way um, the Food and Drug Administration works is if, if you can get a chemical on that list, the grass list, generally recognized as safe, that chemical would be used in any product and you don't really have to test it any further. Um, and you don't even have to report that it's, that chemical is in the ingredients. Diacetyl was tested on animals in terms of ingestion, and there's no indication that eating this chemical is dangerous. But breathing it is fatal, or can be fatal, and it's killed at least three workers, and many others are waiting for lung transplants. Um, the FDA did nothing about it, so I finally petitioned them. I said, okay, please you know, reconsider whether this chemical should be considered safe. I was, they blew me off, needless to say. But they did open a docket. When you file a petition, they have to open a docket. And uh, a really remarkable thing happened, not because of the docket, but um, there was a, a man in Colorado who had very bad breathing problems. He had trouble singing in his church choir. He went to his physician, and his physician thought perhaps he had a disease called hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which is associated with exposure to a number of different organic products, mostly pigeon feces, actually, um, or to pigeon products, or bird products. Um, he was sent to National Jewish Medical Center in Denver which is a very important respiratory disease research center, and referred to the top expert there, a woman named Dr. Cecile Rose, who happens to be the physician consultant to 
the Flavor Extract and Extract Manufacturers Association, the trade association of the chemical companies who make diacetyl. Uh, this, the trade association has the unfortunate name of FEMA, and it, it, it had the name long before the government agency was um, founded, um, and so they're keeping their name. And after a number of their members were sued by sick popcorn workers, um, I think FEMA really got religion, and they hired National Jewish Medical Center to help them assist their member employers to protect workers. And so Dr. Rose was one of the few physicians in the country who had seen cases of popcorn workers' lung. Now, just by chance, this man in, in Colorado was sent to, him, or sent to her, and she worked him up for hypersensitivity pneumonitis, did not find any indication he had the disease. And at the end of two, years, two hours of, of a workup, she was very frustrated and said, by the way, do you ever eat popcorn? And he looked at her, he said, I am Mr. Popcorn. Turns out he ate two bags a day of extra butter popcorn. He just cooked up his microwave. He didn't you know, go put the, um, you know, the bag over, over his nose when, after he made it, but he was exposed to high enough levels that caused bronchiolitis obliterans. Dr. Rose did the right thing. She wrote letters in confidence to OSHA, to the Food and Drug Administration, to the Centers for Disease Control reporting it. The letter she sent to the Food and Drug Administration was then put in my docket, the docket for my um, case, my petition. And once it was there, I, it was a public record, and I released it to the New York Times, and I put on our blog the pump handle. And that's why everybody sort of you know, got this case and knows about it. That is the one case of bronchiolitis obliterans in a popcorn consumer, which I believe is, was recognized only because he had the good fortune of being sent to Dr. Rose. There probably are other cases out there. But by now, most of the popcorn companies have removed diacetyl from their product, and hopefully there won't be any more cases as a result. But what's interesting is the Food and Drug Administration still has done nothing about this and has made no effort to take this on. The, the FEMA, the Flavor and Extract Manufacturers Association, have joined with the labor unions involved and with the public health community asking OSHA for a standard. And this is one of many examples we've seen now during the later part of the Bush administration where industry has recognized we need more regulation. In fact, their concern is that, that they have responsible members who don't want to use this chemical or only want to use it in very strictly controlled conditions, but they will be undercut by cowboys who are willing to work with this and expose workers and who will disappear and never get sued. And so they need OSHA to come in and essentially set the floor and say, don't let people be exposed to this chemical. Of course, OSHA has, has, just won't move forward to do this. Um, and it really is the abdication of, of public health responsibility in these cases. Now, another thing I try to take on in the book is the issue of, sci of scientific interpretation and advice. Scientists produce studies, but they also interpret studies. And that's a very important role in terms of protecting our public health. We look to scientists and panels of scientists to say, OK, what does the literature say? When we look at the whole thing, what do we need to be protected from? What are the safe levels of different chemicals? Uh, and when scientists and groups of scientists get it wrong, we pay the price. The most tragic example of this in recent times is Vioxx. And it's a story many of us know, but I'll recapitulate it very briefly. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration approved Biox in May 1999. The initial studies were um, many of the, the initial studies were imperfect, and they lent themselves to conflicting interpretation about the safety of Biox. And there was disagreement between independent experts and experts who were either employed by or were consultants to Merck, the giant pharmaceutical company that made Biox. And when I'm talking about consultants to Merck, I'm not talking about doctors who just put up a shingle and they say, well, help Merck out. These are well-known academic physicians, professors at major schools of medicine, chairman of departments who, have been, who assist drug companies in their work. That's part of what physicians do. Um, what's interesting about this story is we had these initial imperfect studies, and then eventually we have what we call the gold standard in epidemiology, a double-blind placebo trial, which answered the question for us. So we can go back and look at what people, how people interpreted the imperfect studies to begin with. And it's sort of an interesting natural experiment. Um, not long after Vioxx went on the market in 1999, several well-known cardiologists were raising red flags. In August 2001, the Journal of the American Medical Association published a review by three very well-known cardiologists associated with the Cleveland Clinic, uh, pointing out that in the initial studies that compared Vioxx to Aleve, or naproxen, the patients taking Vioxx had two and a half times, or 2.4 times, the risk of, of cardio cardiovascular event, heart attacks and other things, compared with, with those taking naproxen. 
Now, there are two ways to look at this study. You can either say that Vioxx greatly increased heart attack risk, which is what these independent scientists said, or that Aleve gave powerful protection against heart attacks. And that was the conclusion of well-known academic physicians or consultants to Merck. But getting it wrong came at a very high cost. Uh, after a couple of years later, um, Vioxx started a study, um, Merck started a study looking at whether or not Vioxx could prevent colon polyps. And since we have no um, treatment for colon polyps, or no prevention of colon polyps, this study used a double-blind placebo um, methodology. In other words, people taking Vioxx were compared to a placebo, and we found the same exact thing, that there was a two and a half times, three times the risk of heart attacks among people taking Vioxx compared to the placebo. So no longer a question, you have to take the drug off the market immediately, Merck felt. Um, by then, by the time September 2004, when it was pulled from the market, by then 20 million Americans had taken Vioxx and tens of millions more in the rest of the world. And there are some FDA scientists who estimate that in the United States alone, Vioxx caused somewhere between 88,000 and 140,000 heart attacks. It's a public health disaster. Now, when you go back and you look at that initial debate between the scientists at the Cleveland Clinic and the scientists who were working for Merck, it's very difficult to believe that the scientists working for Merck honestly thought that Aleve pre prevented 60 or 70 percent of the heart attacks. If we had a drug that did that, that could prevent 60 percent of the heart attacks, we'd put it in the water supply. But it's equally difficult to believe that these scientists were lying, that they actually knew Vioxx caused heart attacks, but pretend it didn't. So where does that leave us? I think what was going on here is that, and these are very well-known scientists, their scientific judgment was clouded, it was hopelessly clouded, by their financial relationship with, with Vioxx's manufacturer. They just couldn't see what was obvious. I'm reminded of a famous quote from Upton Sinclair. It is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. Now, the upcoming change of the administration will offer Tremendous opportunities for change, I hope. At the beginning of my talk, I spoke about the Enronization of science. I think there are some great lessons to be taken from the Enron debacle. I think we need legislation requiring full disclosure of sponsor involvement in scientific studies, and we need to ensure that scientists who advise us on how to interpret these studies are free from financial conflict of interest. Paralleling the changes in reporting and disclosure requirements that followed Enron, we need something I think we can call Sarbanes-Oxley for science. I think the problems I describe in the book are not insurmountable, and so I want to end this talk on an up note. Um, uncertainty can be real or manufactured. Government programs need to recognize the existence of real scientific uncertainty and develop programs that take that into account while rejecting manufactured uncertainty. One of the things I'm proudest of, and I write about this in the book, is my work for the Department of Energy on a compensation program. Before coming to the Department of Energy, the before my coming to the Department of Energy, the position of the US government was that we never made anyone sick while we were making nuclear weapons. We exposed people to radiation and numerous toxic chemicals, but we never made them sick. At the Energy Department, internally, we called that policy deny and defend. There were many, many sick workers across the nuclear weapons complex, frustrated and angry about their treatment, and the US government rejected all of their claims. When I arrived at the Department of Energy, the first day I was there, uh, Secretary of Energy Bill Richardson called me into his office and he said, there are sick workers in Oak Ridge, I want you to go down and talk to them, I want you to tell them I want to help them. And he gave me essentially 60 days or, to come up with a solution for, the, for their concerns. Um, he asked me to come up with a program. I went and I met with them, I was the first Energy Department official willing to meet with them and hear everything they had to say. I sat down with them one night about 7 o'clock. We went way past midnight. I continued to do that and visited workers all around the complex from Hanford, Washington to Los Alamos to Savannah River, Rocky Flats, the Pantex plant in Amarillo where we assemble nuclear weapons and had long public meetings, always going well, well past midnight, hearing people's concerns and talking to them about what they did. And these were, these were heroes. These were Cold War heroes, civilians who put themselves in harm's way to make nuclear weapons. So first we won the World War II and then won the Cold War. Uh, we had to help them. The Department of Energy had lost all credibility. We could no longer be the people to decide who had occupational illness and who didn't because no one trusted the Energy Department quite correctly. Uh, however, with radio 
with radiation exposure and with the chemical exposures, you actually, you can't be sure in many cases whether or not the, the disease was caused by the exposure. Beryllium is an, an exception. We can identify beryllium disease very easily, but if someone has developed leukemia, was that from the radiation exposure? We can only speak in terms of probabilities. We know a great deal about the exposures and the effects from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but we don't, certainly don't know enough. But we can make probability statements saying, what's the likelihood that someone who is exposed to this level of radiation has a cancer associated with that radiation exposure? Um, even though we don't have enough information, we can't use that as an excuse to do nothing. I helped design a program that tries to address these issues. You may not get it right every time, but it's designed to make sure we, don't, we do not fail to compensate people who may need to be compensated, meaning we no doubt incorrectly compensate some who don't deserve it. But it's a purposeful policy, not a mistake. Uh, I'm proud to report the program has already given out $4 billion to sick workers and their families. And after almost 60 years of deny and defend, the US government has finally made peace with the past. I think it's a wonderful example to look at. Thank you so much, and I'm happy to take your questions. Hi, thanks for coming to Google. Um, when Sheldon Rampton was here from Center for Media and Democracy, um, someone asked him what he thought you know, a solution, a legislative solution to the, this sort of thing was. And he said that he didn't think that any laws should be passed because they would restrict freedom of speech. And I'm wondering what your view is on that. That's a great question. And I think Sheldon and I agree for the most part. You, you don't want rules saying people can't make certain statements or write certain studies. On the other hand, if, you want, if anyone produces a study and they want the government to use it in protecting someone, then they have to provide certain information. I think disclosure and transparency can be legislated. Or simply say, if you don't give us this information, we can't use it in regulation. In fact, that's the model that most major medical journals use. You can't publish an article in the New England Journal of Medicine without describing the financial relationship you have with the sponsor of the study. Furthermore, the New England Journal of Medicine, the Journal of the American Medical Association, leading medical journals take the position that if a sponsor paid for a study and put the condition on it that the sponsor had to approve publication of the study, those journals won't even take it for publication. They say that's not complete science. You know, if only a certain result would be published and the other, half, the other types of results would disappear into you know, someone's file cabinet, we won't publish it. But, if you, but a regulatory agency has none of those abilities. I was a regulator at the Energy Department. In fact, that's why I eventually got into this question. I would receive reports from industry, and I would look at them saying, you know, I don't believe any of this. I want more information. But officially, you can't go back and, you know, when an when agency is issuing a standard, you have to accept everything people send in. I would like legislation that says, if someone sends in a study but doesn't declare what the relationship is between the sponsor and the scientist, and under what condition it was done, the agency doesn't have to consider that study. So I think there are things you could do without limiting free speech. Another legislative fix, and I've been thinking about this a lot. I testified at a hearing of the Senate um, Environment and Public Works Committee a couple weeks ago, uh, chaired by Senator Boxer, who, and I was asked this very question. Another thing I think which happens is independent scientists, academic scientists, and government scientists are outgunned by corporate scientists, because corporations can spend millions of dollars producing anything they need to take on you know, the government scientists. So you'll often have sort of two government scientists Take, working on an issue, and this will be one of the six issues they work at, and they'll go into a hearing, and there'll be 25 consultants to the corporations there who could produce much more and talk much more than the government scientists. What we might consider doing is having, legislatively, an independent public health and environmental advocate saying who could put some resources into promoting public health side of these studies. The model for this is the Small Business Administration actually has exactly this. Under the, the years when Newt Gingrich ran Congress, they passed a Small Business Act, which gave the Small Business Administration the responsibility to, or the ability, to advocate for small businesses in front of the EPA and in front of OSHA and in front of other agencies. So every time EPA wants to issue a regulation, they have to go through all these new hoops with the Small Business Administration. It always says, wait a minute, that's, I don't care about public health. That's bad for small business. We ought to be doing that for the environment and for public health. Sir. Um, yeah, I'd like to ask a question about the, the word doubt. Um, one of the reasons, I think, for the word doubt is simply the lack of understanding generally among the public and even, you know, legislators of, you know, just basic principles of science. 
Um, the idea, you know, for instance, that something is a carcinogen, you know, what does that really mean? Um, people don't understand, you know, that there's a continuum of, you know, this stuff immediately kills you if you touch it to, you know, prolonged exposure over 50 years could increase your probability of something 1%. And how do we, um, without sort of having these spin doctors as an opposing force, how do we communicate that in a way that, to the public and to legislators, in a way that's sort of fair, um, scientifically? You raise an excellent question. It's difficult to do that. And legislators, of course, who have many, many other tasks, are often aren't willing to listen to those, the complex explanation. But it's important for us to do that and to continually to say, science can only go so far in answering this question. You know, we have many chemicals that were concerned cause cancer because we have animal studies. We certainly can't expose humans to them, yet we don't know if they cause cancer in humans. Do we need to wait to find out how likely is it that an animal carcinogen is a human carcinogen? There are lots of important questions which help us answer the, get to the question of how much do we protect individuals. But the problem that I see for, you know, the regulation and discussion is always around a specific chemical and saying, okay, how do we protect people from this chemical or that chemical? Usually, we don't have anywhere near the amount of research. And in many cases, there's no reason that scientists even want to take on the research. I'll give you an example. Um, we know a tremendous amount of, about asbestos. Asbestos has been studied you know, for years. The National Institutes of Health really doesn't want to spend any more money studying asbestos, nor should they. There are a lot more important issues. There are a number of scientists who work for companies that made asbestos breaks. And those companies are being sued. And they've produced some studies that say, well, the asbestos in asbestos breaks is different than other asbestos and doesn't cause mesothelioma, which is a terrible disease caused by asbestos. I don't find those studies, the new studies, particularly convincing, but no one in the scientific community who's not associated with one of these brake manufacturers has any interest in taking this issue on. Why study it? It's, it's not an interesting subject. We want to study new things. But they've, they've, they've raised enough doubt, and they've said, well, there's something going on here by producing this. And it's very tough to take on, because it, you know, we won't get new science. We won't get more science. We have to rely on what we have. Thanks for the presentation. I was a research scientist in the chemical industry prior to, to coming to Google, and um, you, you spoke a little bit about almost an adversarial relationship between government scientists and industry scientists, and I just wanted to point out that, um, in my experience, the, the vast majority of industry scientists are um, you have high ethical standards right. and would never engage in the sort of behavior that, that you, you speak of. Um, for people that fall into that category, though, are, I mean, are there things that you have know, strong, upstanding industrial scientists can do to combat the issues that you, that you describe? You couldn't be more right. The vast majority of scientists who work for the chemical industry and other industries are terrific, and they went, they're scientists because they want to understand the world and make it better. What happens, it's an interesting dynamic, and I've seen this many times, when a company gets into trouble and they have a chemical that they know they're going to have to either clean up or pay money for, they don't look to their own scientists. There are these outside consultants, many of whom work for tobacco, who they call on. And they leave their own scientists sort of, you know, in the dust because they need the people who will produce exactly what they want. It's very tough. And I've seen over and over again scientists who work for major chemical companies feel very frustrated because they want to do the right thing. And, the, you know, the, they want to make the world better, you know, through chemistry. And that's often what, that's the reason they went into it. Um, and the same is actually true for government scientists as well who, who are often told that, you know, they're in an even worse position because they, they're told they can't speak for their agency. Um, it's very tough. I think what's important is that for the fraternity of scientists or the fraternity and sorority of scientists, the associations we have to be very aware of this and to weigh in. And the National Academy of Sciences, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, have tremendous um, public prestige. And I would hope that they would get involved in providing platforms to ensure that you know, scientists have the right, essentially, to, you know, to talk about their work when they're unhappy about their work, to talk about that as well, to have dissension. You know, and we, of course, expect to see dissension among scientists and disagreement among scientists is valuable. And we want to encourage it. We don't want to penalize people for, for disagreeing. Um, you know, it's come up recently. The Food and Drug Administration used to take the position that once the, the agency may posi took a position on a, a drug, there could be no internal dissension on it. So they would have public meetings where they would discuss whether or not a drug should be licensed, allowed to be sold. And the position was, this is, you know, this is what the FDA thinks. And even if a scientist who's presenting it doesn't agree, wasn't allowed to say that. That recently has changed. 
And the FDA now says, okay, if you disagree and you've worked on this, you could come to the meeting and say, I know my bosses and other people think this, but I think that. And the world hasn't ended. You know, in some ways, it gets to the earlier question. It recognizes that scientists disagree and that we need to move forward taking into account these disagreements. And I think that's something we want to encourage and encourage the openness of, of science. I was wondering if you could speak to the international picture. Are there things that we can learn from other countries? Well, that's a good question also. Certainly, I mean, in Europe, um, they're moving much more rapidly toward a requirement of testing, drug, uh, testing chemicals before they're on the market. Now we have a system where, for the most part, for chemicals that are already on the market, we don't do anything about them until we discover that people are getting sick. We call it the body in the morgue method. And that happens far too often. Uh, new chemicals, before they're sold, actually do have to, certain information about them does have to be reported to the Toxic Substances Control Act, under Toxic, Toxic Substances Control Act, to the Environmental Protection Agency. But for the most part, not much is done. In Europe, there's, going to, there's a requirement now that important chemicals have to be tested. And there's a basic battery of tests that um, will be done on all major chemicals that will tell us whether or not we should allow people to be exposed. Fortunately, the same companies that operate in Europe operate here, so we are the beneficiaries of stronger European protection, but we certainly should be moving in that direction as well. In general, though, and this is something I talk about in my book, the system we have to protect workers and the environment, which uses a chemical-by-chemical -chemical assessment, is bound to fail. We don't have the scientists, we, don't, we aren't willing to put the money into our agencies to, to regulate every single chemical individually. We can't. There are thousands and thousands of chemicals in the workplace, in the environment, and it, OSHA has issued in the last 20 years, now this is Democrat and Republican administration, less than 10 new standards, 10 new chemicals they've examined. And there are hundreds of new chemicals I introduced to the workplace every year. So we can't keep up. So we need to re-look at the system and look at ca broad categories of chemicals and to move toward a system of really trying to reduce exposures overall because we can't, e we can't ever test enough chemicals. And that's something Europe is moving toward as well, and I think it's something we should be looking at. So. Uh, I've looked in, in the content of your book, and maybe I missed it, but uh, what is the situation about uh, cell phones? the uh, radiation I, from the cell phone and from the central antennas. You know, I, I don't discuss that in the book. and I, I, ha I haven't looked at the research very carefully. I think, though, the lesson from the other categories is it's very important to ask scientists who are not associated with the cell phone industry to examine the data. That's all I could say, that it would be very worthwhile. There are a number of studies that are done on cell phones by some of these same consulting firms, and you know what they're going to say because they were hired to give cell phones a clean bill of health. They may be perfectly safe, I, I don't know it, but I would want, this is an important enough issue, obviously all of us are exposed, our children are exposed, people, no one has been exposed to a cell phone for 50 years now, but certainly in 40 years that they will be. We, we need to answer these questions as best as we can, and it would be important to put together teams of scientists who are not associated with the cell phone industry to examine the data. I think that's all I could, I could ask. So would the U.S. government be more concerned about the health impact on their citizens if they had to pay for the negative health impacts that their citizens incur? So if we had universal health care, would that help mitigate this somewhat? I, I, certainly, I certainly like to think that universal health care um, and prevention would be a good thing. Would, would, um, it's something that, that would be driven by this. I mean, obviously, if we, make peop if we help people live longer, we'll save some money. Not, not necessarily lots of money, because people do get sick eventually. But if you could prevent illness, um, whoever is paying for that illness has some incentive to prevent it. But right now, for almost all occupational and environmental illnesses, the costs are socialized. And they occur when people are o over the age of 65, for the most part, not only, but they go into so to Social Security and Medicare. And mm -hmm. if they're younger, and their studies show this, a tremendous amount of the cost is borne by society through Social Security disability, through veterans' benefits, et cetera. We pay for those, we pay for those costs. Rich people don't get environmental illnesses as much as poor people do. Sir, you have to go, go to the mic, though. Okay. I actually read that um, uh, if you add up all of the payments for health care uh, due to workplace illness, it adds up to more than the net profits of all the corporations in the U.S. So that actually the U.S. economy would fall apart if, that, if they actually did have to account for those costs. 
you know, that could be the case, obviously, I don't know. But, but um, what's interesting now is we are, the current system we have for compensating people and for picking up the cost of work-related illness has absolutely failed. I mean, very, very few work-related illnesses are identified as compensable because they occur years after exposure took place. Usually people aren't at their workplace where they had the exposure, and no link can be made. Plus, workers' compensation is a terrible system. Anyone who's ever been injured and applies to workers' compensation knows it's humiliating. Um, you don't like the medical care you get. If you have reasonably good medical insurance or you have Social Security, uh, if you have Medicare, that's what you use. And so we do pick up all those costs. And it's a subsidy to, to dirty industry. It's something certainly worth thinking about, how to take care of that. Good. Well, thank you all very much. This is a great pleasure to be here, and I appreciate you coming. <laughs>